Now we are going to uh, start our panel one on the US-China strategy competition during the new administration. This panel is going to be chaired by Professor Gordon Holden. He's the director of China Institute University of Alberta. And oh. Professor Holden, prior uh, his, uh, to his academic uh, commitment, he was the former director general of the East Asia Bureau of Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. He has rich experience as career diplomat in Canada's East Asia policy, particularly on China. So uh, without further ado, um, Professor Gordon Holden, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and um, Nong, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to be uh, taking part in ICAS annual conference. I think my camera is turned off by the host, it says. If that could be turned on, I would be grateful. Very good. Um, the, our panel, Prospects for U.S.-China Relations after the presidential election. Um, I, I, before I comment, though, on the substance, I'd just like to thank the Institute of China America Studies and you, uh, Dr. Hongnong, for the, the support of, uh, and the, also from the National Institute of South China Seas, uh, Dr. Wu Sun, as well as the Carter Center for their support for this enterprise. This conference, as you know, is normally held in Washington in June. And has always given me a good opportunity to visit that great city at a wonderful time. And it's been postponed for COVID related reasons, but in a way it now falls in a more appropriate timing. It's poised between the US presidential election and the January inauguration of President elect Biden. And that timing is particularly auspicious in my view. The panel's title, Outlook for US China Strategic Rivalry, warrants, in my view, several days of examination. But we'll use our 100 minutes. I think we're running a almost half an hour late, but we'll use our 100 minutes to illuminate what we might expect on US-China strategic rivalry on the cusp of the Biden administration. It's self-evident in 2020 that the US-China bilateral relationship is the most important global relationship on earth and the one with the greatest prospect for either solidifying global peace and prosperity, or all, but also the relationship that poses the greatest risk of generating instability and conflict. As an outsider, as a Canadian, the state of this relationship, in my view, will certainly affect third country relationships with China and the United States, including diplomacy, trade, and strategic considerations. But I'd like to turn immediately to our talented panel. I will make short introductions. You all have access to their full biographies through the ICAST event messaging. First, uh, Michael Swain. Michael Swain is director of the East Asia program of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Dr. Swain is a prolific author on US-China relations, is co-editor, co-director of a multi-year crisis prevention project with Chinese partners. Dr. Robert Sutter. Dr. Sutter is professor of the practice of international affairs at the Elliott School of George Washington University. Dr. Sutter has combined an impressive academic career focused on Asia with a broad experience within the US government. Zhu Feng, Dr. Zhu Feng is the director of the China Center for Collaborative Studies for the South of the South China Sea at Nanjing University. Dr. Zhu has an impressive career, both as a leading expert on China's security issues and as a widely published author on China's foreign policy and diplomacy uh, throughout Asia and including relations with, with the world more generally. Dr. David Finkelstein. Dr. Finkelstein is vice president and director of the China and, and Indo-Pacific Security Affairs at the Center for Naval Analysis. Broadly published on security issues related to China, Dr. Finkelstein has also served in significant China-related postings at the Pentagon and at the US Military Academy at West Point. Dr. Shen Dengli, Dengli. Dr. Shen is Professor of International Studies at Fudan University. His research is focused on China-US security relationships nuclear arms control and disarmament issues related to US-China relations. Let, let us now turn directly to our panelists who will take eight minutes each to make comments. This will be followed by a Q&A session. So I now invite uh, uh, Dr. Swain to, to make comments, please. Well, thank you very much, Gordon. It's a pleasure to again participate in this ICAST sponsored uh, conference and to see, albeit virtually many old friends, I think these kinds of bilateral dialogues are more important than ever. 
Uh, in my remarks, I'll address two issues. What are the larger underlying drivers that are accelerating the onset of great power rivalry in this relationship? And what does the Biden administration portend? Um, I'd also like to try and discuss possible Chinese initiatives in the relationship that could improve it if I have time, but I probably won't. Uh, maybe we can do it in the Q&A. Um, the factors driving the Sino-US rivalry of uh, uh, strategic tensions are pretty clear. Uh, what's not so clear is the relative importance of these factors among them and what needs to be done to reduce their effect while preserving each nation's core values and interests. Several interrelated factors are contributing to a negative vicious circle that will not go away with the end of the Trump administration. This circle is driven by what I would call the three Ps, power, political system or ideology and policies. So at root, it's a combination of a power transition involving assumptions about hegemonic stability, about whether or not a single country should dominate a particular system in order to provide order and prosperity for that system. But it's much more than just this. It's also a sense of an ideological rivalry that increasingly infuses the relationship and prompts a lot of emotional responses on both sides. It's also the result of specific foreign and domestic policies that each side is adopting in part to address often domestic political and economic needs. And then finally, it's, it's the result of a growing disconnect in the minds of elites and publics on both sides between what each country says it wants and what it is actually doing. <clears throat> and uh, we can discuss what those gaps are, but I probably won't have time to go into that. In any event, to address the insecurities and the uncertainties that these factors are producing, each side is today taking primarily deterrence, not reassurance policy initiatives in dealing with the other side that work to deepen the insecurities further, thus driving this vicious circle. As reflected in, for example, references to the inherent superiority of either democracy over socialism or the socialism over democracy, assertions of the US need to maintain military primacy globally and especially in Asia, or for China to be at the quote, center of the world stage, unquote, an increasingly zero sum assessment of technology and economic activities leading to zero sum perspectives and a fragmentation of these spheres and resistance to engaging in meaningful confidence building measures and arms control dialogues on hot button issues such as Taiwan, the South China Sea, et cetera. Now there's an obvious need in my view to redress this imbalance between deterrence and reassurance without either side conveying uh, a sense of weakness or political weakness that could be used domestically. Now, will the Biden administration offer a new opportunity to make such a shift from deterrence to a more balanced deterrence and reassurance policy? And will China make use of this opportunity provided by the Biden administration? That's a big question. I have no inside information on this, but there appears to be grounds for both optimism and some pessimism when we look at the Biden administration. On the optimistic side, hopefully the rhetoric on the US side will be less inflammatory, more cognizant of the need for serious cooperation on a range of critical issues from climate change to pandemics to trade, and even perhaps to some technology issues, and with more support for other positive sum initiatives that can be taken with other countries in Asia and elsewhere, including with China. Uh, and a particular stress on cooperating as much as possible, in particular on dealing with the pandemic. Biden has said that he wants science and reality to rule in addressing the virus. This should mean that he will support non-political scientific interactions with China on this very critical issue. And hopefully this means that the Biden administration will end the counterproductive Pompeo style attacks on the CCP and the hinting of a desire for regime change. And then finally, on the positive side, the overall stress in US policy, I think, although will remain on competition over cooperation, this competition will likely be defined in ways that are less zero sum and not oriented towards the idea of China as an existential threat. Now on the Chinese side, hopefully Beijing will reflect on how through concrete actions, it can facilitate such more moderate US moves and create the basis for reducing the gap that exists in US and Western thinking between what China says it stands for and wants and what it appears to be doing in some areas. Now, some of this 
requires changing actual Chinese behavior, while other, I think, moves require dispelling Western and US misconceptions of various Chinese threats with verifiable facts, not with just words. Now, on the pessimistic side, looking at the Biden administration, I think Biden wants to bridge the partisan divide in the United States to develop a broader political consensus on a range of issues. And countering China is at present a big bipartisan issue in the United States. It's supported by both Republicans and Democrats. And this could incline Biden towards compromising with the right in the direction of greater toughness on China in order to solicit broader political support. I hope that's not the case, but that could very well be the case. And there are individuals within the Biden camp who believe that the right and Trump more or less correctly diagnosed the problem China presents, but was merely incompetent in implementing an effective policy. While acknowledging more readily that the US needs to cooperate with China in some areas where it clearly serves US interests to do so and where China is indeed compelled to cooperate, the Biden administration will likely seek primarily to work with other countries to coordinate in balancing against China. Now there's also, I should state on the more negative side in some ways that there is a large human rights uh, community, activist group in the Democratic Party, as we all know, something, something that Trump didn't really care that much about. And this group will certainly pressure the Biden administration to place more pressure on Beijing. I wouldn't call this reflexively a negative thing, but it all depends on how it's implemented and how it's carried out. I think there are certain things the United States government needs to say and do regarding human rights issues, particularly within China. But how it handles this issue is critically important. Finally, I think there's little real indication of a recognition within the Biden camp of the need to create a more stable balance of power in Asia, where the dangers of conflict are the greatest. By transitioning away from US primacy, which I don't think is any longer feasible, US military primacy, toward a less offensive regional denial, not control oriented military posture. And the Chinese, I hope, will do the same in orienting themselves in that direction. Um, and I think there's also no indication of a recognition of the need to develop some confidence building measures with Beijing on military deployments regarding Taiwan or with regard to maritime disputes. So I'm not terribly optimistic on that score. And I think it's not just because of Biden. I think that's also partly because Beijing itself does not really seem to want to engage in developing such meaningful confidence building measures either. So all in all, I think there's an opportunity to improve the relationship in mutually beneficial ways. And the Biden administration will likely do some things to do this and move in that direction. But the momentum, the momentum towards greater competition, deeper competition, greater rivalry, I think will certainly continue. The question again becomes how best to balance this deterrent side of the equation on the part of both countries with credible, verifiable reassurances that could help allay some of the more extreme views on both sides. Gordon, am I out of time? You're spot on time, well done. All right, I'll stop there then. We can talk later if, if people want about what I think China needs to do. I'll end there, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I will turn immediately to uh, Dr. Sutter, please. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure for me to contribute uh, in my small way to this uh, very important uh, meeting and this panel. Uh, I thought I would focus heavily on American domestic politics in dealing with China uh, and contribute in that way uh, to forecast what I think is happen going to happen over the next year in dealing with China from the United States point of view. And what I see is drift. That's my main out outlook. I'm going to explain why. Uh, the first, uh, it's first, it's the very, it's the unprecedented American uh, uh, domestic politics turn negatively against China. We haven't seen anything like this in 50 years. As, as Michael said, this has momentum, and he's absolutely right. And it runs up against, and I think we've all seen this in the first panel, the Chinese government is not prepared to change the behavior that it has practiced, that is the uh, incentive and the focus of the antagonism on the part of the United States side. They're not going to compromise in, any, in significant ways. 
And so when you put these two together, you, I come up with the conclusion that we're, we're at an impasse. And this impasse will be managed in various ways. Mr. Biden will be more discreet in many ways, but basically it's an impasse. And I'm not sure Mr. Biden is even in a position to make meaningful changes in the existing policy uh, toward China today. Let me just uh, try to elaborate why I think this is so, so important on the American domestic politics side. Uh, the emergence of this turn against China happened over three years. Many of you uh, know this very well, uh, but it's a coalition, a coalition of Trump administration officials and uh, the vast majority of members of Congress, both on the Democratic side and the Republican side. And they've been very, very active on this since 2018. Uh, and this is, uh, has, and it was quite, quite busy in 2018. And there's a sense of urgency that I have never seen in dealing with China in 50 years in Washington. The sense of urgency, the sense that China is now in a position to actually dominate. And it may happen in Asia, as, uh, as uh, Michael emphasized, this, uh, this change of balance of power. But the key element in, in many of the uh, minds of congressional people and others is in the high-tech area, that China will dominate the high-tech area. And that will be the key to dominance. And so the, the concern in Washington, and I think uh, among those that are pushing this, in, is often along these lines, the worry of dominance, that China will dominate the United States. And so they're taking measures to deal with this kind of a situation. Uh, and, but this idea didn't really transfer to the country really well in 2018. It was very evident in Washington, but it didn't spread very well. Uh, but finally, 2019, the, the media picked it up, uh, mainstream media picked it up. But still then, the Democratic candidates in the election campaign, the public opinion polls, didn't reflect a big sense of urgency about China. They didn't like Chinese government and this type of thing, but not a sense of urgency. Uh, but the urgency and the sharp negative turn comes with the pandemic. And with the pandemic, uh, the, the vast major majority of Americans blame China for this. And China's leadership is seen as untrustworthy. Uh, and, you, and so the polling shows this repeatedly throughout uh, 2020. This becomes a major issue uh, in the campaign. Uh, well, it becomes the main, main foreign policy issue in the campaign. Uh, and, uh, and it's something Mr. Trump obviously tries to use uh, to his advantage, and the Republicans try to use it to their advantage. Mr. Biden changes his position remarkably as a result of this. Look at what he said in 2019 and look at what he said in 2020. They are very different folks. And, uh, and it reflects this sense of public opinion and where public opinion is. And so when I look at that kind of a situation, I say this, this is, uh, this is a, 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 a very significant uh, development. And it hasn't changed now. So it's just where it's, it's continuing. And so the outlook is Mr. Biden has a more nuanced uh, approach toward China. I'm sure he does. He has a much more experience. He's gonna do the things that Michael said and what uh, Steve Orlin said, uh, it, it, this kind of thing. He will try to move in that direction. Can he ease, can he ease the US counters, US counter efforts that exist against China today? Can he ease those? And my argument is no, he can't realistically, unless the Chinese make significant compromises. And will the Chinese make significant compromises? I think not. I think we've seen enough this morning to show that that's not going to happen. And so if he does this, if he moves and without Chinese making significant compromises and moves to ease tensions, he's going to be attacked. He's going to be attacked by all those congressional people that spent three years building up various mechanisms to uh, compete with China in a very sharp way. And the Republicans particularly will be active. They're already active uh, in, in laying out uh, positions on this issue. And, uh, and so they will, and the Democrats will probably be quiet because Mr. Biden is a Democrat. They probably don't want to upset him, and, but they won't be happy uh, with this kind of uh, one-sided type of, uh, of move. Uh, and so what this means is that he's, Mr. Biden will have, if he does this, will have unwanted controversy in Congress and more broadly, the media is focused on this issue. 
more broadly, when he needs cooperation on the pandemic, on reviving the economy, all the domestic issues that uh, Graham Ellison talked about earlier. And so in the sense of priorities, I have to say, do you really want to move forward with China? And I think you have to say that's, a, that's going to be very counterproductive at this time. And so do I need to go forward with China? And maybe you don't need to. Maybe you don't need to. Uh, but the bottom line here is that, uh, and then the other point I would mention here is, is moving forward with China in an accommodating way without a, a compensating uh, action on the part of the Chinese government will probably divide the people within Mr. Biden's camp. This is a very big tent. And he has lots of people in his camp that are, uh, agree, as Michael indicated, they agree with the, the thrust of the Trump policies, uh, as well as many others who want to go back to sort of the approach of the Obama administration. And so if that division persists, if, that, if, it, if it's exacerbated by a decision of the president to move forward with China, then that will be, cause friction within the administration. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have friction with the administration, that's made to order for people in Congress. That's, that's how they deal with these issues. It gives them leverage in doing, in moving, in moving in one direction or another. And so I think you have the, this, this, the danger here that you'll have ongoing controversy with media coverage and members of Congress moving in directions to, who oppose what Mr. Biden is doing uh, and getting a lot of publicity. As a result. So my conclusion is because of this situation in American domestic politics, substantial constraints on American, caused by American domestic politics uh, exist for President Biden to ease existing U.S. countermeasures against China uh, 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 for, the, for the foreseeable future. I think this is something for 2021. I think this is going to be very difficult. So I, this is what I hope to add to our discussion. I thought Michael's presentation was very broad ranging and had many interesting elements. I'm trying to focus it down to a more, sub, more uh, a, a specific issue. And I think it's an important one. It's one that we're uh, addressing today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sano. I'd like to now turn to Dr. Zhu Fong. Uh, Dr. Zhu, the, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. So uh, I really like the mic and uh, uh, Bob's you know, presentation. So to be a Chinese scholar, so current situation has never been so uh, depressing for me in, in, in the past uh, three decades since I got into the university um, in, in China. So then traditionally, what's the US, what does the US mean for Chinese students and the Chinese people? I think the US is, to be honest, US is beacon. US is great enlightening Democrat beacon to light up China's direction. So then in the past four decades, what kind of a driving force to always move the China ahead? The good relations with Washington and the Americans accommodation to today's China, to China. But I have to say just less than four years of the Trump administration, Americans Democrat beacon is totally eclipsed. The reason is, the U.S. also become increasingly a lulu power in the world of politics. The, lose, the, the reason is whatever you take the China as a punch back and hitting the China so hard and all American doing against the China now is totally against norms and doctrines where totally learn, uh, learn and be taught in the past four decades on how to look at American behavior, look at America's leadership. Yes, the reason is very simple. Trump is very emotional. I think he's some sort of a, just a great Chinese, uh, uh, great hostility to China largely came from his pandemic retaliation. Don't remember, even just uh, uh, Wuhan become the first city just uh, got into lockdown on the January 23rd. The President Trump also just uh, uh, issued his Twitter and uh, praising Xi Jinping and the China's action for transparency so responsible. But after the US get into, you know, public health emergency state on the March 3rd, March 13th, I think the Trump totally changed the face. And he just very, very discriminatory, always just naming the COVID-19 as a China virus. 
I think he was so he's so na- uh, mind narrowed, and he's so mind narrowed, and he's also so just the less just objective on how to examine uh, the pandemic and its implication to U.S. Then I think it's based on his some sort of uh, such a, a, a very we say uh, grabby, you know, the response to the uh, pandemic crisis in the U.S. Just yesterday, Americans pandemic, you know, patient deaths also hit, hit the historical high, historical record high. But the problem is, I think he's uh, still fighting and uh, claiming the, the election fraud and also always see his winning was still and uh, stolen. So then, in facing of such an American's president, I have to say he's not just emotional, and even in the human uh, uh, rights standards, he's a vicious American's leader. Trump has never been keep the Chinese feel shamed on the United States. Under his leadership, what are happening to our bilateral relations? I see it's not his pandemic retaliation to China. But gets back to the uh, February, no Democrat candidate just uh, won some sort of more than 10% of a popularity and a spot in the, uh, uh, this year's you know, the general election. But finally, he got lost. On the other hand, then we'll see US has never been more divided and a more, you know, some sort of way say, uh, slip, slipped off. Then uh, hate crime also just uh, how say increases so significantly against this backdrop. I have to say a lot of Americans' response to China is also out of very apparently and firmly such a crime, hate crime. For example, then we will see Taiwan issue. U.S. also just uh, how say turn back to its uh, traditional, you know the obligation to China and the blur the one China policy and are still just trying to play in the China to show some sort of a military adventurism. To be honest, I don't think the Taiwan issue is a real, some sort of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, most un- unstable you know, factor because for China, the, the Taiwan issue really matters. What matters for us is keep the China still moving ahead. Moving forward, so my view is that whatever Biden will do with his China policy, I think he also significantly proved to be much better than the President Trump. The reason is he's more professional, he's less emotional, and he's more nuanced in his any conclusion of the China approach. So from this point, I think we also have two Chinese, we say, broadly shared American illusion today. One is oh, our relations couldn't be back to the past. Trump, when the Obama, President Obama visited Beijing, I think in his first term, he declared his China policy is U.S. welcome a strong, emerging, and a stable China. But look at today's Trump's policy. He declared a new ideological Cold War vis-a-vis China. Then. I think that such a past is also very, very, very uh, missing for most of Chinese. But the problem is we should be facing up to such a new reality. The second is, yes, we will see the Trump's, uh, Biden's policy of China could be just uh, how say, focus more, focusing more on such a coordination with the airlines. Then the China will be definitely just the isolated and content I think such an answer we have to wait and see what also will be the uh, uh, real answer. So my view is this. So for the moment, I think the Chinese has never been more frustrated in our relations with the United States. The only hegemon power in the world and only leadership in the world in world of politics. So then I hope our American friends could just uh, have say, cast a clear Look at the, today's China's accumulated frustration. We never, never want U.S. losing you are, you know, some sort of a beacon as to, still to uh, enlighten the China for our future, you know, the trajectory. The second is China by nature is transformative power. If we're looking back the past four decades, 
What kind of force truly just to move the China forward? Usually we have a Deng Xiaoping like, we say some sort of a masterpiece, mastermind, but it's a rare. Mostly China, how China could have moved in forward, expectedly international pressures. So that's why to be honest. So I'm still cautiously optimistic about the, 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 our relations under the Biden because your pressure somehow could serve a positive pulling force to get China move ahead in some sort of uh, good trajectory as broadly expected, not Americans, but Chinese as well. But the, the, the last point I want to make is this, Ambassador Tri Tian Kai also made it very clear. Today, China also care a lot. You are all a China expert. The face issue usually matters a lot. So don't just unilaterally ask the Beijing to do this or do that. The any some sort of the stability or the any expected uh, modification on the change of the Chinese behavior should be, should be reciprocal. If we can move such a way, I also see that our relations could just uh, going better off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zhu uh, Fang. I will now turn to David Finkelstein, please. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's just terrific to be with so many old friends from China and the US who are as invested in this relationship and concerned about it uh, as I am. Uh, the obligatory caveat that the views I'll put out here are strictly my own. And you'll have to excuse me because I was trained as a historian. So I tend to look back before I look forward. So the first point I would make is that uh, this relationship did not get to this unhappy condition overnight. It's been slipping and sliding over the course of the past decade or so. And I underscore the, the phrase decade or so because rising tensions in the relationship did not, in my view, begin with the Trump administration in January 2017 or its national security strategy as suggested in the abstract of this panel. Looking back, by the time of the second Obama administration, a consensus seemed to be building inside the U.S. government and in some quarters outside U.S. government that policy towards China needed to be recalibrated to account for mounting concerns about some PRC policies. Of course, on the PRC side, I like to point out that uh, if you read uh, a lot of the, the information coming out of China, uh, Xi Jinping by 2014 was already advancing the assessment that quote, great power competition was entering a new phase in all domains. So this idea of great power competition has been acknowledged uh, on the Chinese side previously. And uh, in 2016, prior to the US uh, presidential election, I, I was part of a joint PRC US study group that focused on trends in the relationship. And it was comprised of analysts from both countries. And it was organized by Ambassador Fu Ying, who of course is now at uh, Tsinghua University. And it was the combined judgment of the US and PRC participants that the relationship was headed for increased difficulties across several issue sets, political, security, economic, and military, based on systemic frictions that Michael Swain has addressed and specific policy uh, disagreements that Bob Sutter has uh, alluded to. And all of this is by way of offering that while it is true that tensions and problems in the relationship have accelerated uh, over the past couple of years, it took a decade or more for us to get to this unhappy point. The conference organizers asked a big question about the major drivers, and I think Michael Swain has, has done pretty well in, in identifying them, but let me add a, a few more uh, points maybe. I, I, first, of course, we're in a period of time in which mutual suspicions are not only rising, but solidifying. In both countries, each side looks at the other's policies and actions and assumes the worst possible motives. And it doesn't take more than looking at official documents and commentary in both capitals, both capitals, to provide many examples of this. Uh, second, it does not appear to me that Beijing and Washington currently have in place 
the channels or mechanisms necessary to manage the wide range of deep-seated tensions that are exacerbating relations. If these channels exist, perhaps they do, they are not readily apparent. I do not think that anyone would ever argue that the former security and economic dialogue, the SNED, was a model of perfection as a mechanism. It had positive dimensions and it also had some issues. But I also think it would be difficult not to characterize the four big dialogues established by President Trump and President Xi to replace the SNED as anything but a failure in addressing the problems in the relationship. If there is positive news to share, it would be that it appears that it is, it is the Pentagon and the PLA that seem to be the most focused on risk reduction and confidence building measures, even as they eye each other warily. Third, mutual disappointment colors the larger context of this relationship. Uh, for Beijing, there is the long standing assessment way before Trump that the US will never accept the legitimacy of the CCP, let alone accept China as an equal partner, and that the US is determined to constrain China's rise. I mean, how, how many years has the term Xi Hua Zhongguo and Fan Hua Zhongguo uh, been part of the party lexicon? Uh, for the United States, in addition to concerns over a long list of specific PRC policies, there is, as Bob Zolik has put it, a growing conviction among many in the US that China's rise has been achieved at the expense of the US, its open system, and the liberal international order. Fourth, we have to account for domestic pressures, as Bob has already done this. Uh, domestic pressures are a significant factor in uh, adding to the tensions in the relationship. Both sides are currently experiencing a period of nationalism, populism, aggrievement, and in some cases, nativism that have the potential to negatively affect the bilateral relationship by constraining what leaders can attempt to do within it. Moreover, both sides have elevated the importance of domestic economic security, broadly defined, under the umbrella of national security, the technology issue that Bob referred to. And at the moment, these differences are at the top of the agenda of fractious issues. So to finish up, where do we go from here? Because many of the divisive issue sets in the relationship are deep seated and not easily resolved, we must assume that tensions in the relationship are not going to go away anytime soon. Therefore, it seems to me that the key going forward for both Beijing and Washington is to determine how best to manage, manage a relationship that is fraught with tension and highly competitive, while at the same time, entertaining the possibility of cooperation on those occasions when it serves our respective selfish national interests to do so. So relationship management, issue management, and competition management seems to be the order of the day. With the advent of the new administration, many friends in China are wondering how the relationship will unfold. But Chinese friends need to appreciate, as I am sure they do, and as Bob has underscored, that here in the US, there is a bipartisan consensus, a rarity these days, but a bipartisan consensus nevertheless, that many Chinese policies are detrimental to US interests and the international order. Consequently, how this relationship is going to unfold will be as much a function of China's US policy as it will be of the new US administration's China policy. Wu Shitsun, my old friend, with whom I hope to play golf one day in Heiko, <laughs> mentioned that the American dream of many Chinese has been shattered by the Trump administration. I would also add that Chinese friends need to look at their own policies and ask, as John Pomfret once wrote, who lost America? So finally, people make choices, governments make choices, and leaders make choices. Ambassador Tsui Tenkai and I agree on this, and those choices have consequences, and hopefully wise leaders are going to figure out how to deal with this. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Figgelstein. And then we'll now turn to the, our final panelist, uh, Shen Zhong, De, Shen Lingli of Fudan University. Um, Dr. Shen, please. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind invitation. Uh, 
talking about uh, uh, China-U.S. relations for the next U.S. administration, uh, mainly uh, the Biden government, uh, I would say, on one hand, I would not expect too much. Because uh, Zhu Feng has mentioned and others have mentioned, uh, there have been a U.S. bipartisan consensus uh, that uh, China's behavior has challenged the international norm and challenged uh, the global uh, way to accept a, a good norm. So China is unacceptable by America and many American friends. Uh, Trump may be forgotten for many reasons, but at least he would leave some enduring foreign policy legacy, which may be inherited by his successive U.S. government, which is to watch China, to keep America on high alert, and not to accept the China's bad behavior and whenever necessary to beat. I think there is a high Americans uh, consensus not to accept China. And this is not only existing in the US elites, but also in the US public. 74% uh, of American view is very unfavorable to China uh, per the recent Pew uh, polling. This would dramatically uh, restrain the flexibility of the Biden government's uh, handling uh, toward China. So this is my first view. I could not expect too much. A second, I think uh, as the China-US dialogue is zero at this time under the Trump administration, but uh, at the Obama time, 140, now zero. So this is almost, we have touched the bottom. Uh, the further bottom could be China-US to cut off our official relationship to wage a war, and Taiwan and the US would restore uh, their official tie. This, that's very unlikely, uh, even though it's not unimaginable. But uh, luckily, US changed the government. Luckily, Chinese government seemed to have some twisted behavior recently. On the one hand, try to have a low key, not to respond to uh, Secretary Azar's visit to Taiwan too much, uh, when he seemed to accord Taiwan's official uh, recognition. Uh, at the same time, China tried to beat uh, Secretary Pompeo as he indicated that Taiwan has never been a part of China. He stated this on November 12th when he was interviewed. So China sometime was quite sometime China to be, uh, uh, seemed to be uh, ferocious. So I think uh, Biden is seeing a China which is very different from the China when he became the vice pres president 12 years ago. When China's GDP was between four to five trillion US dollars. But last year, China's GDP was 14.4 trillion US dollars, which is three times as big as China was 12 years ago. So this China is a different China that the US had to be, uh, had to take care. So China under President Xi Jinping is very unwilling to repeat what uh, uh, the previous Chinese government tried to do uh, to cater the US demand to uh, exercise our own pensions in order to have a certain stability of relationship. Uh, Ambassador Tritinga said that we, we have stability. We need it for close Taiwan Strait relationship and for uh, Korean Peninsula. But for the past, the stability comes from China's behavior to cater US demand. Now China says, it's my turn to give a Chinese model 
a Chinese methodology, a Chinese recipe to the world, <laughs> which is something American can not accept totally. The world has to have only one recipe, one road, one source, one path that is uh, a city upon a hill, not a pack cynical. So when, when China think it has been different, it's time for China to claim its own leadership. Then the two countries have very severe uh, confrontation in the past uh, three years uh, with uh, the highest confrontation over our responsibility uh, concerning the possi possible covering up of the COVID uh, spread. But at the same time, I would say, uh, why President Trump has not been uh, re-elected? I think he would not be re-elected. Despite the fact that he got his more votes than he was uh, four years ago. And why President Biden got the highest vote for the entire US presidential election history, some 80 million. Most people probably they don't, they are not a fan of Biden, a great fan, but uh, they don't extremely differ with President Trump's policy, which divides America, making America not to sustain its global leadership, to make America moral image in the world to decline. America may uh, attain some short-term benefit, but America is quickly losing it's a global and a regional leadership, which America has hard won through winning the Second World War, the Pacific War. But America is losing. America is quitting all kinds of international organization, uh, yielding a leadership void for others to compete. And China has a big chance. So America is back, a better America, which would be pro-internationalist liberalism, which would accord uh, respect to uh, procedure, to negotiation, to uh, international coordination. So Biden has said on the very first day of his uh, showing into power, he would bring America back to WHO and uh, Paris Climate Change Accord. That gave me a, a little comfort because China US may not restore, uh, restore our past 140 dialogues, but at least we could restore two dialogues. One is uh, our cooperation within the Paris Climate Change Accord, how China US can work together to share our efforts to cool down the rising temperature of our atmosphere. Our two countries have responsibility. China is the number one emitter of, of carbon and America number two. But in terms of historical accumulation, China may be already number one, but uh, America has a responsibility to return in order not to have such a global effort to be led by China. America should lead or to collead with China. So I think the two countries have a chance to reestablish a working group to talk about this, how we should work together. And WHO, with America's return, Australia would not be isolated. Australia is beating China and China is retaliating against Australia and American Australia, Japan, India, and many countries on one side, maybe 60, and China on the other side, maybe 100. And they could continue to compete as to how to uh, trace the origin of this virus. And if there is certain cover up in China or in some other countries, but China and the US have renewed the possibility as the two countries used to do against uh, Ebola, against H1N1. So this time sharing information. The winter is coming, Maybe more COVID would return in China and in America, and we need to share information. If we used to co cover up, no more. And we need to uh, offer our 
own a medical resource and uh, uh, this uh, uh, virus information with each other and supporting jointly, not China supporting WHO. The uh, US is working with various individual countries of the members of WHO, but outside of the WHO framework. Within the framework, China and US can share information, provide a resource and, and uh, uh, work together. We may never work together again to co-build a certain vaccine, but uh, how we spend money in India, in Africa, in a collaborative way. So this is second thing I would think. And returning to JCPOA may not be an imminent uh, policy uh, initiative for Biden, but uh, this would remain on his policy agenda. And with the US possible return, US has more say uh, to condition Iran not to lift the UN sanction. In order US to play a role for UN not to lift the sanction on Iran, US has returned to JCPOA. And uh, that would help China to work with the other uh, our parties to persuade Iran to be to more abide by uh, in a verifiable way of Iran's obligation under JCPOA. So this is, in my view, another way for China and US to have a dialogue. And uh, trade. Biden may not lift the tariff uh, which has been imposed thus far. And he may still demand China to honor China's words in the first phase agreement of China US trade and uh, economy. But he may not be eager to push for the negotiation for the second phase immediately, which would demand China to have the fundamental structural reform, how to monitor China's SOE, the government should abide by its word uh, under WTO not to give excessive uh, benefit to state-owned enterprises in a verifiable way. So this would be not be another uh, collection point between China and US. And possibly over time, uh, US would reduce certain of its punitive tariff upon China already, as China has already removed China's own sanction on the US. If China is willing to implement its obligation by basically 200 trillion US dollar additional service and goods in these two years, Dr. and uh, with a good record, US may be willing to talk to China more. So this is another possible cooperative area, even though uh, US could still keep some tension with the US. Thank you, Dr. Shen. My real concern is okay. Taiwan. Thank you. And the uh, US has passed many law, and Trump could uh, visit Taiwan in the next month. And the uh, US Secretary of State has already said Taiwan has never been a, China, a part of China. And uh, President Xi Jinping may have promised to President Obama not to militarize uh, those uh, uh, rock structures in South China Sea uh, at a time when Biden was there. So Biden may push the envelope for China to honor its promise. Some issue on Xinjiang and uh, uh, Hong Kong, that uh, China seems not to be able to understand why it uh, matters so much for China-US relationship. China may think it's not your business. US think it's the first business of all businesses. Could you wrap up? I think we're at our end of time. Thank okay. you. Okay, one minute. Of course. So I think uh, there are ample chance for China and US to keep the tension, but the worst time may have been gone. And we have a little more hope for negotiation and for talk. So for this, I echo uh, Zhu Feng, I'm cautious, optimistic for the next one year or two years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shen. And I apologize for we're wrestling against the tyranny of the time. And I apologize very much. We still have approximately half an hour for questions. The first question I'd like to pose is actually suggested uh, in a text from uh, Dr. Swain, um, and you touched on it very, very briefly, Dr. Shen, and that is the short-term issues 
And I think this relates a little bit to what uh, Dr. Sutter was saying as well, the domestic constraints of US-China policy. Uh, there's a troika of issues that, um, like Oswain mentioned, uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, which you just touched upon, uh, Dr. Shen, as well as the pandemic. And I'd like to just ask one American and one Chinese respond to these, uh, Dr. Sutter and Zhu Feng. Perhaps Zhu Feng, if you could go first, followed by Dr. Sutter, just quick responses about those three neurologic issues. Um, how much of a factor are those and can they be managed, please? Okay, so very quickly, I, I think the China's performance at the Xinjiang, of course, has been uh, quite a controversial. But on the other hand, if you know the China's history in the past more than 1,005 years, today China's policy on Xinjiang for some sort of stabilization has been gentlest, safest, and even just the way, say, uh, most secure. So Xinjiang, you know, is... Um, uh, part of the China's border area and in recent years and also very, very hollowly and deeply affected by the uh, external, you know, Islamism and the Islamic, Islamic some sort of a, such a, 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 a groups. So then um, I see the Xinjiang issue has never been getting more uh, fragile uh, because I've been to Xinjiang a couple of times. Today, yes, I think the international media reports a lot on China's learning campaign in Xinjiang. Then you say it's a, some sort of a Chinese systemic, you know, such a, a, a persecution of the Islamic uh, Xinjiangese. But partly, I think the China's policy probably is a little bit harder, but partly, as I mentioned, uh, if we have a historical comparison then what we see is today, China's policy of Xinjiang has never been better in the past 1,005 years. So I hope our international audience could cast some sort of Chinese historical perspective and looking at today's China's move in Xinjiang. But to be honest, what just got me uh, worried most is not Xinjiang, is Hong Kong because Hong Kong is bridged between the East and the West, is also indispensable channel to bridge the China and the, the US and the Europe. So I really hope the China's Hong Kong policy could just uh, say, uh, treading softly and also taking care of a different concerns. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, Zhu Fong. Um, Dr. Sutter, please. Um, thanks very much. Uh, on the Xinjiang and Hong Kong issues, I think you see the Trump uh, period as being much more uh, uh, active in, in taking positions on this, and the Congress is supporting that. Uh, I would expect that to continue. I don't think the, Italy, the Biden administration, uh, they obviously have people very concerned with human rights, but I think what Trump is, the Trump administration has done on Xinjiang and Hong Kong is about as far as America has ever gone on these issues. I think it's uh, it's a, it's a, they have been very tough on these, on these questions uh, insofar as uh, of, of, of what uh, of past practice. If you look at the you know, what the Democratic candidates said about these issues in the campaign, uh, they really didn't have much action, uh, whereas the Trump people are taking action in quite significant ways. So. I don't expect it to go further than what you're seeing. I think it's a matter of maintaining these things. And you're going to have laws now that uh, that uh, impact uh, this type of situation. And all of this will be things that Mr. Biden will inherit. And so it's a matter of just uh, following it, it seems to me, rather than uh, making a, uh, making further disruption in the policy. On the pandemic, I think that was part of Michael's concern. Obviously, this is something that the administration would want to work with China on in some way. I, I they do want to go back to the WHO. Um, and so I would assume there'll be some uh, uh, discussions with China in this context. I, I don't see that as a concession to China in any way. I think that can be done in a way that's, uh, that, uh, that, that says it's, this is a pragmatic thing that we need to do. And, uh, and so that's my basic sense on this. I, I, don't, see, uh, I don't see these uh, Hong Kong or Xinjiang as major disruptions because the disruption has already taken place and it's sort of being solidified in law as we speak. Thank you very much. And the next question uh, is on the quote, the inevitable first meeting between uh, President Xi and President-elect Biden in the early days of the Biden administration. What expectations are there? What could be accomplished in that? And here I'm looking for 
very quick rapid fire responses. And I think uh, we go to three people, Michael Swain, uh, David Finkelstein and uh, Shen Ding Li in sequence for just rapid fire responses, one minute perhaps for each of those. Michael, please. Okay, well, um, I don't have any inside information on the inclination of either side to have an early meeting between the two leaders. I think it's probably quite unlikely. Um, so I, I don't think that when, when Biden takes office, his focus is not going to be on dealing with China. His focus is going to be primarily on the pandemic and primarily on getting the U.S. economy up and going again in a way that is readily recognizable and that really has an impact and cooperate, re-engaging the United States in the world community through multilateral uh, inter interactions and with, with US allies. All of that is gonna be the priority of the Biden administration. So I don't really foresee the idea of an early bilateral meeting between the two leaders. Um, and if there is such a meeting, um, I would think it would really focus on those issues that really are um, amenable to some level of cooperation between the two sides. And I hope it would be without a uh, sense of the rhetoric that we've been seeing so much from both sides in recent uh, months and years. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Finkelstein, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I agree with Michael. Uh, I, I wouldn't hold my breath about uh, a top leadership meeting anytime soon. Uh, I cannot think of another possible meeting between president-elect, soon to be President Biden and any other foreign leader that would require more preparation, more coordination and more negotiation than one between president-elect Biden and Xi Jinping. Uh, so <laughs> the, the, the landmines uh, around that meeting are extensive as Bob Sutter uh, pointed out for domestic political reasons, plus, uh, not all the team is in place. So, and, and again, as Michael said, uh, this is not issue number one. It may be uh, the most important national security issue foreign, but uh, this, is not, this is not going to happen. If it does happen, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, interested to see how that plays out, but uh, I don't think anytime soon. Over. Thank you, David. Um, uh, Ding Li, please. Uh, well, uh, for, for Xinjiang, I think uh, China's purpose is to get the stability uh, in Xinjiang, and we have them. Uh, but uh, the approach for China to achieve stability uh, apparently is uh, very controversial. Uh, in my view, I, I, uh, my view is not the government view, and maybe very likely is uh, is uh, is not welcomed by my government. And my view is China, US need to have dialogue on this. What might be a more preferable approach to bring stability back to Xinjiang? America can tell us. And uh, we, we should be humble in listening. And if it's good, why don't uh, learn? And then for pandemic, China is saying America is not qualified to send its uh, scientists to come to China to inspect. I have a different view. Whatever happened in the past, China-US still need to have dialogue. And China should welcome American scientists, medical doctors, and medical uh, authorities to come to China, to visit our facility, to talk to our people uh, freely. And our scientist, medical expert may come to US to visit the American facility uh, in a reciprocal way. Don't say you are not qualified to say, let's work together to uh, cooperate, open our facility and our people for you to interview, to talk, and to read some of our documents. This is a way to help rebuild the, uh, the trust. We may never restore the for forest amount of trust, but at least we should not deny others to visit us. This is my view. I know it's not a government view, but I would still suggest this view to all parties. Thank you very much, Dr. Shen. 
Uh, we have a question which was originally posed to the keynote dialogue and has been hanging. It takes us into a very different area. I'm not looking for lengthy responses, but short responses. And this is broadly that uh, the demographic trends in China, uh, apparently within 15 years, there may be more people over 60 than there are people in the United States in total. This will have profound economic and social implications for China. What might be the implications of that for US-China relations? I'll go to again one American, one Chinese in this case, perhaps first uh, Dr. Sutter and then Zhu Feng, please. I guess the only comment I could make is that uh, it, as you look at the demographic trends in China, um, it reminds us that China has weaknesses. Uh, they have uh, uh, the, this rising power that, uh, that China is, uh, nonetheless confronts a lot of problems. And um, this is a big one. Uh, and uh, this, has had a, this has an impact in a number of other developed countries. Uh, and I think this is a feature that one needs to keep in mind. So I guess, uh, you know, I wouldn't straight line China's rise. I, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. Uh, I think you need to look at the vari variables that, uh, uh, that, that, that are negative for China. And there are many. And so it's just that they don't get too much attention. And so uh, uh, I don't want to, it takes a long time to explain them all. Uh, so I'm not going to do that here. Uh, but I think it, it makes uh, this a very uh, dynamic relationship between the United States and China. It isn't necessarily... This rising China, this rising China is going to rise up and be this uh, this uh, this overlord. I think it's uh, it's much more complicated, and we need to uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, um, just a one more observation. I think that China's demographic issue is going uh, more severe. My country is obviously and and so very clearly we say uh, going uh, growing gray. Um, most young generation, uh, young couples, they prefer not to have a kid. On the other hand, where we we'll see uh, something what is happening in China, also, you know, just uh, how say took place in Korean as well as in Japan. So East Asia now, as a, a common community, we say we are facing some sort of uh, uh, broadly shared, you know, the difficulties in raising the fertilities. One is high educational cost. Then second is the young uh, couples, young generation prefer to have a less kid. Then third one is, then we will see some sort of, uh, we say such a process, you know, the surging and inflation. And I also get people just to prefer some sort of uh, uh, better of their personal life, not to just, uh, how say, have a more children. So traditionally we say Confucius culture usually always see have a good children is always a big we say moral of a family value or something like that. But now it's totally derailed. So then I really hope Chinese government could just how say understand how severe China's going gray is is turning. So then a couple of the policy of just a very, very you know, apparently and also very, very smartly uh, take, for example, now we have a, a two kids policy is totally allowed. It's, it's a big away from the uh, family planning policy. Then we really hope the government could declare all the children, whatever, whatever the number is you want, it's a totally set free. So probably it's a good boost. But on the other hand, I think it also depends on China's you know, uh, escalation of uh, uh, living conditions and even just the house of basic income. So we have a lot to do. A, a last point is, from this point, it's not a demographic challenge for my country. So we're also facing a lot of our challenges. So by nature, I have to say, China at large remains some sort of a transitional power and even uh, domestically, domestically vulnerable power. So any exemption, China will dominate the US. T to be honest, it's totally out of question. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. And we have a specific question for you again, uh, uh, Zhu Fang, and that is that uh, recently President Xi made a comment about uh, potential Chinese interest in joining the TPP. I would like to combine that with a, a question to um, David Fickelstein 
are there prospects the Biden administration might re-examine or seek to re-enter the TPP? Just very, I'm looking for a quick response because we are, our time is limited. Uh, Jufong first, just a quick response. Is that a serious comment? Is that a prospect? Yes, I, it's, it's a big surprise to me when she just publicly just made that point because personally for long, uh, as a scholar, I prefer the uh, APTTP to you know, RCEP because you also know that such a two different parallels just to repre represent different openness and a different liberalization of a market. So then uh, the Xi uh, finalized his, you know, the agreement China could get into the uh, TPP, I think is a bigger leap for China's some sort of at least a policy readiness for, you know, the, 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 the open the China as much as we can. Thank you. Uh, David, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I don't have the crystal ball uh, to tell you whether, whether the administration will or will not, but I would be surprised if his highly capable people have, had not already studied uh, CTTPP and, and uh, have been looking at the pros and cons and possible ways they could, should they decide to do that. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question. Questions are pouring in far more than we'll have able to respond to in our next uh, 15 minutes. But one question that's coming in is from, a, I believe, a, a, China, a Chinese participant in this webinar. It's very much getting lots of questions from the US and lots from China. Um, this question, I'll read it quite literally, uh, word by word. Will the US beef up advocacy of the concept of liberalism in the next four years and use ideological differences as a weapon? Um, um, it, it's an interesting question. And uh, of course, seen from a Chinese perspective, I believe. Perhaps um, Michael first, and then this is a question aimed at the United States. Michael, and then uh, Robert, please. Well, I, I don't know about using it as a weapon, but I, I do think that, as I said in my remarks, that the Biden administration is likely going to place a higher emphasis on the general issue of human rights and China's illiberal behavior. Uh, in a variety of areas as part of its policy. Um, a lot of this in terms of human rights issues has to do with domestic issues within the United States. And there it's a really tough thing for American leaders to be able to address human rights without responding to the kind of pressures that they get internally. And they also themselves believe in the need to do this. Um, so I think you'll get a certain amount of that. And I think China could do certain things that would reduce that focus um, by the United States on these human rights issues. Um, more broadly, in the sense of the international order and global norms, um, I think that the pressure on the idea of China's illiberalism will play a role in defining, you know, what is the global order, so-called international order? To what degree does it rely upon political liberalism or democracy, if you will, as an essential element of that order. And is China's, the fact that China is not a, a liberal democracy, does that mean specifically that China uh, resists many fundamental elements of the global order? Um, I don't think it does. I think that China's, if you will, resistance is is narrower than what most people would argue in the United States. But I think that is an issue area that really needs more serious examination and indeed discussion between the United States and its allies and between the United States and China. I'll stop there, thanks. Okay. Uh, if I could just uh, weigh in a little bit on this. Um, I think the, the, uh, there's a lot of reporting about the Democratic Party people being very concerned about authoritarianism in the world and that the uh, democracies and uh, free trade are under, under assault. And China's seen in, in, in lead in this regard. It's making the world safe for authoritarians. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, the, this, uh, this contest, the competition, uh, and the sense of, uh, of, uh, of rivalry between China and the United States uh, does encompass this area in a big way. Uh, this is from, uh, not so much from a conservative Republican side. This comes from the progressive side. In the, in the Democratic Party, uh, so the, uh, 
there are a number of uh, think tanks in Washington that have written a lot about this who are associated with the Democratic Party and, uh, and, and they focus on these kinds of issues. So um, is it a weapon? Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's a acute debate, a, a acute uh, competition. And China is seen through the Belt and Road Initiative, through working with Russia, through working with Iran, through working with all sorts of other countries, it's seen as supporting authoritarianism uh, as, the, as a counterpart uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the liberal order that the United States wants to foster. Thank you very much. And we have a broad question that's come in. I think it's really a spillover, perhaps from the keynote dialogue. Uh, there's no easy answer to this, but it's broadly, um, uh, I think it's a bit of a, I'd say a fresh critique or a cry from the heart, um, this description of the inevitable uh, competition and, and collision between two great powers. Uh, is this something that is immutable, unchangeable, or is there other prospects some unprecedented dimension that might allow contemporary international thinkers to come together and to be rather more creative rather than be prisoners of this, of this competition. A very general question, but I'd like to perhaps give each of the panelists a minute just to respond to that. Is there a way out of this box? Are we inevitably there? Starting perhaps with Michael, please. Well, I mean, as I said in my comments, I think it's important uh, to recognize that even though we are in a relationship now in which the rationale and the logic for cooperating closely, uh, much less being partners in different areas, is just not there in, in, among elites, particularly in the United States. Uh, and so you have a level of suspicion, as Dave Finkelstein said, that really does fuel, um, and this is also true on the Chinese side, of course, towards the US, that does fuel this continuing uh, deepening of a security and other types of competition. But we are not fated to be in a ever worsening relationship that leads to truly and deeply zero sum worst case assessments of each country towards the other. Um, the United States and China are not in the same relationship that the US and the Soviet Union were in. Um, the relationship is vastly different in my view. And I think that the ability and the, uh, the opportunities for being able to manage the tensions in this relationship are there. And I think that they are relatively strong if the domestic political pressures within both countries can be successfully managed and controlled by leaders who really understand the need to have an interaction with each other that really does provide for tangible and not just words, tangible actions on the part of each side that can help reduce the security competition and the rivalry that Bob is talking about that does now exist. We are not fated for this situation to become ever more dire. Um, if we are, then we really are in trouble because if we get into a conflict over Taiwan or something else, it is not gonna be just related to Taiwan. It is gonna be going, it'll go far beyond that and will pose a much greater danger than any sort of limited conflict or confrontation that we have had with the Chinese or frankly with other countries in the last 50 years or so. Thank you, Michael. Ding Li, um, is there a way out of this box in one minute? So you're, you're muted. You're muted, uh, Ding Li. Go I ahead. think uh, if the two countries should uh, agree with some principle, uh, a rule based uh, international order. So we should act per international rule. Second, verification, trust and verify, or distrust, still verify. We need verification. So when US promise something, China need to verify. China promise something, US need to verify. So let's agree. In order to have a fair and a predictable relationship, whenever we promise something, we should that should be followed with verification. So if these two principles can be agreed, I can still forecast some uh, predictable uh, smooth relationship, which uh, would be more or less constructive. 
Thank you. Uh, David, please. Inevitable competition or impossible competition or a way out of, uh, out of the box, please. Well, uh, I think there's always competition among nations at a certain level. Uh, what I don't believe is that confrontation is inevitable. Over. Thank you. Uh, Robert, please. Thanks. Um, this gets to the issue of the Thucydides trap, which we, uh, we uh, introduced the session with. And this uh, implies this kind of competition is going to lead to war. And I think what the Trump administration has shown, it, 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 was, it, it created acute competition with China, didn't it? Uh, but uh, the idea of war is uh, that isn't that wasn't that those weren't his arrows. His arrows were trade sanctions and uh, and uh, punitive tariffs and uh, export control, things of that nature. And does that lead to war? And uh, I'm not sure it does. I I, uh, I think uh, it shows that you can handle a lot of issues with linkage uh, that you don't necessarily have to go to war over. And I think uh, there's a uh, uh, the, the Defense Department and the Chinese PLA have a clear understanding of the disastrous consequences of such a war. So, uh, so I, I, I'm not so I'm not a, I'm not so concerned about uh, about the uh, the ultimate catastrophe here that uh, that many are concerned about. Obviously, this and I think this competition will continue and it will be acute. And uh, but I don't think it necessarily will lead to this type of confrontation where you have a disastrous war. Thank you. Um, there's a question that's come in, which may also emerge in, in the second panel, but I'll put it with, again, one minute responses. And that is the question of decoupling. I think, is this a feasible thing? Can we, or would we, or uh, could it, can we imagine a situation where China and the US would end up in a, in a situation somewhat analogous perhaps to the US and the Soviet Union where linkages uh, were, were very modest, moving from a situation of relatively deep into interdependence. Michael, please, one minute. Well, I mean, I've, I've said before that I think that the idea of decoupling the US and Chinese economies and technology zones, although I suppose technically possible in some ways would be extremely destructive for both countries. Um, it wouldn't be punishing China or containing China. In some respects, it would be isolating the United States uh, because other countries would take up the slack from uh, interactions with China on economic technological issues. Um, one thing the United States needs to really understand is that even though its allies around the world are concerned about China's behavior in, in several areas, and rightfully so, they do not sign on to the kind of extreme draconian measures that have been voiced by some in Washington and including in the Trump administration, um, they're not going to sign on to this. Asia, America's Asian allies won't, and the Europeans even won't, despite their growing um, concern about China. So if we try to decouple uh, these two systems, I think we're going to be in for trouble for ourselves. And the Chinese, I think, are already doing some of this decoupling um, because of their fears about U.S. Um, dominance and interference in the technological area. We need to have a dialogue between the two countries, the two governments, about the entire issue about what is competition in this economic and technology, technology areas. How do you bound it? How do you define it? How do you bound it? And how do you implement violations? And that sort of discussion has been attempted in the past. It hasn't gone very far, but I think it needs to be re reestablished and we have to have, and, and it has to be done not just at a bilateral level, this has to be done with other countries as well, possibly most likely in the context of a revised WTO, World Trade Organization structure, where that is the strongest existing institution, despite its deficiencies and shortcomings that can address these issues. And, and the United States has basically turned its back on the WTO. China itself has not been doing all that much to really actively support expanding and deepening WTO regulations in these in these all these complex areas. So I think there needs to be a turnaround on this on the part of both US and China and in consultation with and in, in dialogue with other countries as well. Thank you. Dignity, one minute, please. You're muted. Well I, I have nothing to add. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough, a big issue. 
Uh, Ju Fong, um, do you wish to take a minute to uh, on the decoupling issue? Okay, I think under the Biden, decoupling will be going farther. The reason is, I think, uh, uh, some sort of uh, high tech Cold War also just enforced to China by Trump administration. Then any just a house of lingering hostility and China vigils also will inevitably just a house say, uh, move on some sort of a further movement of the decoupling. But complete decoupling, of course, is unlikely. But further decoupling, we say to extend such a deep coupling will continue, continue to extend. So that's also, I think uh, now is the uh, uh, most, uh, it seemed to me, uh, uh, frustrating points of our bilateral relations. Any form of a deep coupling, not just a, a, a severe violation of a, a free market access, but also well, just to prevent the Chinese students flowing. So then it always caused a bigger trauma to our bilateral relations. I really hope the Trump, yes, could do something to securitize the commercial relations, but please get him back to Americans, you know, open market principle because it's underlining element of a globalization and Americans world leadership. David, one minute, thank you. On the decoupling issue, if you wish, David. You're still I think this is an issue that's, that's going to be debated uh, here in the US. Uh, the Trump administration, or at least some members of the administration in the White House had some very extreme views on this. Uh, and I think that, uh, that those extreme views are not going to survive for too long. But I do think that on defense and security sectors and maybe medical security, uh, the discussions are going to continue about how best to protect uh, America's uh, assets. Over. Thank you. Uh, Robert, please. Oh, thanks. Uh, just to add to this uh, pattern of discussion, I agree that uh, the national security, what's happened is that the national security rationale for the United States and some other countries has gotten so uh, concerned with China that the loss of economic uh, uh, benefit that comes from economic exchanges with China is, uh, is overridden by national security grounds. And I think that pattern is, is, uh, is underway. And you see this pattern taking place in dealing with Huawei and how countries that were linked with Huawei are now delinking with Huawei. And I think this pattern will continue uh, in the United States so long as we have the sense of urgency that, uh, the, that the, the competition in high technology and economic benefit is such that we have to uh, use these kinds of government interventions uh, to uh, uh, restrict uh, economic exchanges. One other point that hasn't been mentioned is the Democratic Party in their platform is very concerned about bringing industry, uh, building industry in the United States. Mr. Biden is definitely doing this. Uh, and so this is a, this will lead to decoupling. This is uh, obviously designed to build things here. And, uh, and I think that's uh, going to uh, add to this kind of movement that we see toward decoupling. Thank you very much. Our time is up for, for Q and A, but um, Michael Swain has asked for just a moment to uh, provide some of his ideas on what actions China might take. Uh, Michael, please. Thank you, thank you, Gordon, I appreciate that. Um, I, I wanna emphasize that I'm not saying that China needs to make this relationship work uh, in the way in which some Chinese say that the United States needs to do all the heavy lifting. Both countries need to be able to take initiatives, ideally with understanding about what would come in a, in a sense of reciprocity. But I wanna raise these issues about China because they don't often get raised in these kind of conferences. Uh, we, we hear a lot from the Chinese side about what the US needs to do to restore the relationship to a better uh, situation. But I think China can do many things as well. Um, I think it needs to clearly reassert its commitment to global regimes and agreements on trade investment through clearly and publicly tangible actions that support those regimes, including, as I said, major efforts to initiate improvement of the WTO, especially in technology and investment areas, and to consider and to officially say that China would like to uh, eventually become a member of the CPTPP, as the United States should also do. 
I think that China needs to place limits on the application of the national security law in Hong Kong to apply clearly only to issues of sedition and independence movements, not to those who are advocating for democracy under the spirit of the joint agreement. And there's a very unclear line here in terms of Chinese views and Chinese implementation of that law in Hong Kong. I think China should provide a strategy offering an expectation to gradually close down the so-called retraining and education centers in Xinjiang. It needs to put a stress on the downgrading of those centers, not the expansion of them. I think they're an overreaction. Uh, I think they've been a major, major impact on, on global opinion of China uh, that has been disproportionate to anything else. Uh, and and it, Hong Kong and the pandemics have made it even worse. But I think the Xinjiang uh, training, so-called training centers, are really have caught a lot of the publics in around the world. Um, I think that China needs to clearly declare its commitment to never use force first against any territorial claimants in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, and not and certainly not to dislodge any of them unless first attacked. That affirmation was made in 2002 um, on a very vague sort of level among the different claimants. But I think it's incumbent upon China and the other claimants to be much clearer on this issue going forward. I think China should avoid escalating military pressure on Taiwan. People in the US are talking about Chinese uh, PLA aircraft overflying Taiwan or possibly even the seizure of a small offshore islands in order to show China's resolve, I think these actions would have an enormously negative impact on this situation and create far more problems than they would solve. I think that China should be receptive to speaking with the US on how to stabilize the currently unstable military balance between the US and its allies and China in the Western Pacific, ideally through an acceptance of certain limits on certain types of military deployments across the region. And I think China could take many of these actions without weakening its position, and it would place the onus on the United States to reciprocate. But I think it should be part of a dialogue with the United States about what the two sides can do to show good faith and to show tangible movement that would reduce the level of tension and the sense of threat that exists on both sides. Some people say that we should only have small issue items. We should only talk about improvements among if you will, low hanging fruit, such as reopening consulates and allowing journalists to operate again uh, in, in each country. I think those are certainly commendable and they're good, but I think the kinds of actions, at least some of them that I've been talking about, although difficult, are not impossible. They could possibly begin on a track two level uh, as, a, as a serious source of dialogue or a track 1.5 level initially, but ultimately with the idea of moving them to attract two level at some point. I think they would have a significant impact on our, our interactions going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just in the nature of interest of balance, we're completely out of time, but I think it's only fair that one of our Chinese scholars, uh, in this case, Zhu Fang, if you could do a one minute response to what the US should do, I think it's only fair to give that opportunity in the name of balance, but we have very little time, please. Zhu Fang, you're, you're still, I think the most importantly, the Trump administration, Biden administration should show it's professional. It's show it's a uh, well seasoned, you know, the policy uh, team in dealing with the China. For example, so uh, Taiwan issue, yes, the, the Mike mentioned the, the China, uh, just to have say, don't need to escalate the tension uh, with the, the Taiwan, but problem is, who just uh, has uh, triggered that just a lingering tension. So Trump administration did a lot of uh, very provocative things and the force in the China just the uh, house uh, pushing back. So then on the other hand, where we we'll see, for example, uh, decoupling. So then we, 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 we could see some sort of extension, but don't just uh, cost, you know, damaging and causing domination of our bilateral relations in all the terms. Then last one is, I, I really think the, 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 the both leaders should have just uh, uh, featuring something showing their uh, uh, good, hosp good hospitality, then uh, probably such a, a climate change and even mood change 
could just have say ensuing uh, for some sort of uh, improvement effort for our bilateral relations. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I wish we had several days in a more informal setting, perhaps and certainly post COVID, uh, we can resume the face-to-face -face, uh, discussions which have so many advantages. Um, but thank you all. Uh, I now pass back to the ICAS uh, organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you Gordon. very much, Gordon Holden. And thanks to our five panelists for your great contribution to discussion. We heard so many things. We hear like worrisome facts and from both sides. And we also hear expressed hope, although not very a lot. So the debate will continue.